In view of the possibility of finding meaning in suffering, life's meaning is an unconditional one, at least potentially. That unconditional meaning, however, is paralleled by the unconditional value of each and every person. It is that which warrants the indelible quality of the dignity of man. Just as life remains potentially meaningful under any conditions, even those which are most miserable, so too does the value of each and every person stay with him or her, and it does so because it is based on the values that he or she has realized in the past, and is not contingent on the usefulness that he or she may or may not retain in the present. More specifically, this usefulness is usually defined in terms of functioning for the benefit of society. But today's society is characterized by achievement orientation, and consequently it adores people who are successful and happy, and in particular it adores the young. It virtually ignores the value of all those who are otherwise, and in so doing blurs the decisive difference between being valuable in the sense of dignity and being valuable in the sense of usefulness. If one is not cognizant of this difference and holds that an individual's value stems only from his present usefulness, then, believe me, one owes it only to personal inconsistency not to plead for euthanasia along the lines of Hitler's program, that is to say, mercy killing of all those who have lost their social usefulness, be it because of old age, incurable illness, mental deterioration, or whatever handicap they may suffer. Confounding the dignity of man with mere usefulness arises from a conceptual confusion that in turn may be traced back to the contemporary nihilism transmitted on many an academic campus and many an analytical couch. Even in the setting of training analyses, such an indoctrination may take place. Nihilism does not contend that there is nothing, but it states that everything is meaningless. And George A. Sargent was right when he promulgated the concept of learned meaninglessness. He himself remembered a therapist who said, George, you must realize that the world is a joke. There is no justice, everything is random. Only when you realize this will you understand how silly it is to take yourself seriously. There is no grand purpose in the universe, it just is. There is no particular meaning in what decision you make today about how to act. Footnote. Transference and Countertransference in Logotherapy. The International Forum for Logotherapy, Volume 5, Number 2, Fall, Winter, 1982, pages 115 to 118. One must not generalize such a criticism. In principle, training is indispensable. But if so, therapists should see their task in immunizing the trainee against nihilism rather than inoculating him with a cynicism that is a defense mechanism against their own nihilism. Logotherapists may even conform to some of the training and licensing requirements stipulated by the other schools of psychotherapy. In other words, one may howl with the wolves if need be, but when doing so, one should be, I would urge, a sheep in wolf's clothing. There is no need to become untrue to the basic concept of man and the principles of the philosophy of life inherent in logotherapy. Such a loyalty is not hard to maintain in view of the fact that, as Elizabeth S. Lucas once pointed out, throughout the history of psychotherapy there has never been a school as undogmatic as logotherapy. Footnote. Logotherapy is not imposed on those who are interested in psychotherapy. It is not comparable to an oriental bazaar, but rather to a supermarket. In the former, the customer is talked into buying something. In the latter, he is shown and offered various things from which he may pick what he deems usable and valuable. And at the First World Congress of Logotherapy, San Diego, California, November 6th to 8th, 1980, I argued not only for the rehumanization of psychotherapy, but also for what I called the de of logotherapy. My interest does not lie in raising parrots that just rehash their master's voice, but rather in passing the torch to independent and inventive, innovative and creative spirits. Sigmund Freud once asserted, Let one attempt to expose a number of the most diverse people uniformly to hunger. With the increase of the imperative urge of hunger, all individual differences will blur, and in their stead will appear the uniform expression of the one unstilled urge. Thank heaven, Sigmund Freud was spared knowing the concentration camps from the inside. His subjects lay on a couch designed in the plush style of Victorian culture, not in the filth of Auschwitz. There, the individual differences did not blur, but on the contrary, people became more different. People unmasked themselves, both the swine and the saints. And today you need no longer hesitate to use the word saints. Think of Father Maximilian Kolbe, who was starved and finally murdered by an injection of carbolic acid at Auschwitz, 
and who in 1983 was canonized. You may be prone to blame me for invoking examples that are the exceptions to the rule, said Omnia pre clara tam difficilia quam rara sunt, but everything great is just as difficult to realize as it is rare to find, reads the last sentence of the Ethics of Spinoza. You may of course ask whether we really need to refer to saints. Wouldn't it suffice just to refer to decent people? It is true that they form a minority. More than that, they always will remain a minority. And yet I see therein the very challenge to join the minority, for the world is in a bad state. But everything will become still worse unless each of us does his best. So let us be alert, alert in a twofold sense. Since Auschwitz, we know what man is capable of. And since Hiroshima, we know what is at stake.